again, it's so good to be in the house in the presence of the Lord God Almighty. Today is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah.
spirit of worship. Lord, we just want to worship you in spirit and in truth, Lord God. We give you all our hearts, Lord God. All our praises, Lord, it belongs to you. Hallelujah.
our trust in you, Lord God. Our heart belongs to you, Lord God. Our lives, Lord God, will always be yours, Lord God, in Jesus' name. We glorify your name, Lord. We salt your name on high. We magnify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone, and uh, a happy um, uh, Sunday worship and uh, a beautiful Sunday. And uh, uh, could you imagine we are already in the month of June, and this is the first Sunday of this month of June. And, uh, and we are so glad that uh, we already reached half of the year and um, everything is um, um, getting a, a fast track and um, we are seeing a lot of things going on and a lot of changes in just a matter of days, matter of hours and I know that um, uh, there are many things that uh, you have in your mind right now but uh, I just want to encourage you that uh, this is the day that the Lord has made and uh, we are to rejoice and be glad in this day because it is God's day. This is Resurrection Day, this is the Lord's Day and uh, every time we are gathering we are, we are celebrating the risen Christ and um, I just want to um, 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 uh, take note of what uh, King David said that uh, when he heard that uh, they are going to go to the house of the Lord he was overjoyed and uh, and he was so excited in the same way and uh, by the way we would like to uh, thank the Lord that um, uh, in the coming weeks uh, uh, churches are uh, reopening and there are those who already reopened and um, but uh, we are taking it uh, uh, cautiously and, um, and uh, we're taking the time to make sure that uh, we are doing the right thing and uh, because we wanted to act on wisdom and um, uh, with the guidance of the Lord and by the way, um, uh, in, the, in the recent days, and a um, couple of days ago, um, uh, the world was uh, shocked uh, by the news that uh, was seen all over uh, through the social media. And I know that this is also something that uh, you want to um, uh, have a first-hand um, knowledge. And um, we cannot deny the fact that um, yeah, it affected a lot of people and it affected a lot of lives. And, um, in my hand right now is a copy, a transcript of uh, the broadcast uh, that will be aired across uh, uh, the network on uh, tomorrow, on uh, uh, June 8th. And uh, this is in the program of Dr. James Dobson's Family Thought. And uh, he interviewed uh, a certain uh, senator from South Carolina. And um, he, he is a Republican. And um, he is the first African uh, American in history to ever served on both the House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate. He is a very passionate uh, pro-lifer, uh, pro-life, and um, uh, he has uh, championed many common sense initiatives through the years. And uh, Dr. James Dobson uh, had this um, interview with him, and uh, and uh, this is uh, uh, what is. Uh, uh, included in this interview and uh, Dr. Dobson started by uh, uh, making an introduction that wherein he says that millions of people around the world share a sense of outrage at the merciless killing of George Floyd, the father of several children including a six-year-old girl and then he continued uh, but this murder has led to a mob mentality that's utterly lawless and violent. And then uh, Senator Tim Scott responded that uh, this is a senseless death of an um, African-American man at the hands of the police. And then he continued, George Floyd's brother Terrence spoke out asking for calm in the streets that there's nothing that, that is being done from a violent perspective that will ever bring back the life of his brother. And then Senator Tim Scott continued, I would like to separate protesters and demonstrators from these violent agitators that have nothing to do with George Floyd or frankly justice from the challenges that we face as, as a nation. What you are actually seeing on TV, the violent folks, those people are selfless, selfishly distracting 
from George Floyd's death and at the same time trying to accomplish a very different objective. And from my perspective, according to Senator Scott, that objective is either anarchy or chaos, and they are cousins. That has nothing to do with the peaceful protest of brutality at the hands of the people that we give ultimate life and death decisions and the authority to execute. And then he continued, violence breeds violence. And then furthermore, in this transcript, Senator Tim Scott said, If you want justice for one, you should want justice for all. So if we want justice for George Floyd, then we need to provide justice for all these business owners whose properties and businesses were burned down and the police officers who were gunned down and these people who were injured, they also deserve justice. And then he continued by saying, we have to turn our attention in a constructive manner towards solutions that have nothing to do with the violence of the agitators who have infiltrated and co-opted the non-violent protests that we have seen around this country. You know, as we are affected by this, I would like to share to you four important suggestions. We are to lament. There's no doubt about that. We are to be grieving over, uh, the, over the life of uh, George Floyd. We saw that uh, this is not the right thing. And it is not, and it was not, the right thing to do. We are to be grieving. We are to lament. And we don't have any capacity to pass judgments. We need to let the law exercise its fullest authority to these police officers. It is not in our hands. Secondly, we are to listen. It's been a long period of time that this is being done over and over and over and over, not only for years, not only for decades, but even for centuries. I believe that even these police officers who are simply following the mandates given to them have no power except for this minority who are abusing their powers. We need to listen. And the lawmakers from the Congress, from the House of Representatives, and to the Senate, you need to review the laws of the land. Review the Jim Crow laws regarding this segregation. We need to listen. And thirdly, we need to express love. What the world needs now is love. Because love covers the multitude of sins. Just like what Senator Tim Scott said, violence begets violence. And what we are seeing right now, we're in there are those political people who are jumping on this issue. Instead of pacifying, they are kindling the fire, making the people more, more angrier. And we are to be instruments of love. And then, fourthly, we need to take the lead. 
We need to take them. Something must be done. And it will start in our personal lives. Don't just accept everything that is posted in the social media, everything that is broadcast over the television, over the radio. Have a common sense. Have a common sense. Gather your family. Talk about this. And, 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 and tell your family that we are not to be affected emotionally. We are to be discreet. We are to be wise. And then, over the neighborhood, there must be a discussion. How can we overcome this problem that has been part of this nation for decades and centuries? We need to have a change. And it will start from you. It will start from me. But we cannot accomplish this through violence. We can deal with this peacefully, prayerfully, and being a participant for a change. So much for that. Now let's go to the study of God's Word. And uh, before that, let's come to God in prayer. Father, into your hands we commit everything. Lord, silence our souls. Humble our spirits. Calm our minds. And Lord, we pray that you speak to our hearts. That what we are going, Lord, to hear today, Lord, is something that will draw us, Lord, closer to you. Lord, allow your servant to be a lump so that they will see you, Lord, as the light that will brighten us, O oh Father, in these dark days. Lord, allow your servant to be the vocal cord because you are the voice that they will hear that will speak to them. And make this day, O oh Father, a glorious day wherein, Lord, you will be exalted in our midst. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. And we are now here in Nehemiah chapter 2. And allow me to uh, read a couple of verses because we cannot read the entire uh, um, um, chapter. It has 20 verses. But I just want you to take note on the verse 1. And it came to pass in the month Nisan. Nisan is between uh, the last part of March, early part of April. Okay? So it may be um, uh, March uh, 15 to April 15. So that is the period. In the 20th year of Artaxerxes, the king, that wine was before him, and I took, that is referring to Nehemiah, I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. I want you to take notice of that. Nehemiah was sad. There was sadness. In his face. Verse 2. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad? Seeing thou art not sick, this is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid. You know why? Because you cannot appear before the king in that kind of appearance. And it is a dangerous, dangerous thing. And said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make requests? So I pray to the God of heaven. I pray to the God of heaven. Praise be to God upon the reading of His Word. I will entitle our study this morning, When God Has His Hands on You. When God Has His Hands on You. There are three important things that we can see from this chapter. And uh, the first thing is in verses 1 to 10. Wherein we can see 
the casting of a vision. So the first thing that we can see is casting a vision for change. And this is the clamor right now. People are shouting for change. But what kind of change? Change for the better? Or change for the worse? We need to aim for the better. We need to aim for something that will be good. So when, when Nehemiah had this kind of vision, and by the way, vision comes from God. Real vision comes from God. When the Lord cast this vision on Nehemiah, it took several months. Could you imagine from Mount Kislev, that was December, to Mount Nisan, four months of prayer, four months of intense prayer, four months of coming to God, Desiring to know the heart of God. Desiring to know the plan of God. He waited upon the working of God. So three important things when, when the Lord cast the vision upon Nehemiah for a change. Okay? First, we can see that uh, Nehemiah took the time to pray. Pray. Waiting upon God. He prayed. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ was the best model before us. He started his ministry in prayer. And before he called his disciples, later called the apostles, he prayed before he chose them. And uh, every time he will do a miracle and uh, he will, he will uh, feed thousands of people, he will pray. And even at the dying moments of the cross, he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. And when the Lord Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead, and now on the right hand of our Heavenly Father, you know the ministry that the Lord Jesus Christ is doing for all of us is that He is praying for us. The Lord is interceding for us. And this is a wonderful reminder for all of us, that we are to start everything in prayer and wait upon God. Wait upon God. Let's wait upon the moving of God. You know, waiting on God is not wasted. Waiting on God is not wasted. There is wisdom in waiting. Uh, I was reminded uh, by uh, a dear friend, uh, who is a pastor, who is about to go back to the Philippines after his uh, several months of furlough here. And um, uh, he's catching up um, uh, with his um, uh, flight and uh, just in time. And, um, and um, he was already in line. And um, when he presented his uh, uh, boarding pass and a passport, um, um, the personnel asked him to uh, set aside for a while because they are checking something. So he, the personnel started allowing the other passengers to go inside the aircraft and he was wondering why. And then he was, he was looking and then people are started to empty the line because they are already inside the aircraft until finally he saw himself alone and then the personnel went back to him and uh, the personnel said i'm sorry sir but um, uh, 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 we need to check uh, something with regards to your flight and uh, you can now go in and uh, he went into the aircraft and uh, there was frustration and questions and he even asked himself, why are they doing this to me? But patiently he waited. Patiently he made himself calm. And then one of the stewardess, when he presented his uh, um, um, uh, 
uh, pass his, uh, and his, uh, his uh, passport, the steward that said that, uh, oh, sir, I'm sorry, you are not uh, to be in the economy. Uh, they, they move you to be in the business class. Somebody worked it out for you. And he was surprised. <laughs> and this is a beautiful illustration that uh, waiting on God is not wasted. And, and there is wisdom when you learn to wait. And he, he remained patient, he remained calm, and he just allowed things to happen because uh, he knew God is preparing something good for him. Could you imagine from economy class, now he was moved to a business class. And that's a blessing. You know, God's timing is always perfect. And um, there is a dear pastor from the East Coast who requested a prayer for his wife. And then um, um, he returned um, at, at the update by, um, by thanking all of those who prayed for his wife. And he said that uh, uh, just in time, because the doctor said that uh, um, yeah, there is something uh, that uh, if it is not being uh, paid attention to, it will get worse. But God is working on time. So waiting upon God has something to do with our prayer. So Nehemiah prayed from the month of December to April. Silence. But in those moments of silence, God is moving. Maybe you, say, you are saying that, uh, what is happening? You don't know, but in God's economy, God is doing something. Secondly, that we can see in casting a vision for change, uh, when the king asked him, okay, you, you, you see here, when the king asked him, for what dost thou make request? Simply, the king is asking, what is your request? And then, he prayed again. You see that? He prayed again. And then after praying, he presented to the king, verse 5, If it pleased the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, send me to Judah. What is the purpose of going to Judah? Look at the verse 5. So that I may build it. What is the word it there? That he may build the wall. He may build the wall. So he has a plan. So while praying, he is already planning. So in the plan, he is working while waiting for God. He is already working while he was praying. So he did not let himself to be idle. Rather, he worked on something that will, if be given an opportunity, be able to present his plan. And then he requested the king if he will be given a, a, a permit to pass uh, beyond the border, and he also requested for uh, for timber, for logs that will be used for the construction, for the rebuilding of the wall, and all the res resources needed, he requested before the king. And look and behold, all of those requests were granted. And because he waited upon God, he prayed, he planned, and then you can see here, the third word is proceed, okay? Now, he is walking with God. He made sure that God is with him. Look at verse 8, okay? The last praise. The king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. Could you imagine that? The king granted me. So, it is not the king who initiated this. It is God who initiated everything. God moved the heart of the king. He moved the heart of the governors. He moved the heart of Asaph. He moved the heart of the nobles, the Levites, and all of those who will be participating in this big job, big work 
of rebuilding the wall. We cannot do it alone. You know, it is so easy to uh, point our fingers to a single person when something is going wrong. No single person can make a change. It involves all of us. It involves those men and women, boys and girls, who are committed to prayer, who are willing to, to make a plan for the glory of God and to act upon while they are walking with God. Don't do it alone. Don't do it on yourself. Don't do it on your strength. Don't do it in your own ability and capacity. Walk with God. And this is what Nehemiah did. And the next thing that you can see is that the Lord moved the heart of the king in verse 9. That the king, now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with him. Could you imagine that? The Lord provided security as well. But uh, please be reminded. That every time we are doing something for the glory of God, we can expect things that will break our hearts. And we will go to the next thing. So casting a vision for change. When God has His hands upon you, He will give you vision. When God has His hands on you, you need to step in into God's plan. So this is the next thing. Stepping into God's plan. And Nehemiah stepped in into God's plan. Okay? And uh, remember, changes are from God. We cannot. We cannot create change. Okay? We cannot create change. Real change. Productive change. Positive change. Glorious change. Holy changes are all coming from God. And then he surveyed the place, but look, there are already oppositions. We have Sanballat, we have Tobiah, and, uh, and then others which, which belong to um, uh, the nobles. And these are the influential people. Remember this. Most of the time, those who will oppose you are those who are in influence. Those who are in position. Those who have authority, those who have a clout, they are the ones who will oppose. And they are the ones who will try to thwart, to hinder every noble things for the glory of God. But Nehemiah, in spite of knowing this, stepped in into God's plan. So he surveyed the place and by himself, not even discussing it prior to his move to anyone. He kept it upon himself because he wanted to be sure that this vision is really coming from the Lord. And he wanted to make sure that no interference will be while he is executing God's vision for change. So he was there and then he viewed the wall, verse 15, and then verse 16, this is the next thing. Look at this. When he stepped in into God's plan, he started to share the vision. Look at verse 16. The rulers knew not whither I went or what I did, neither had I yet told it to the Jews, nor to the priests, nor to the nobles, nor to the rulers, nor to the rest that did the work. Then said I to them, so after con confirming the vision, now, verse 17, he started sharing this by motivating them, by encouraging them, by involving them. You see the distress that we are in? He showed them the real picture. We are in distress. Will you allow yourself to be in distress? Will you allow yourself to be in this condition? Will you allow yourself to be in this traumatic condition? How Jerusalem lieth ways and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come! So he encouraged them. He motivated them. 
Let us build up the wall of Jerusalem that we be no more a reproach. Don't let anyone point their fingers to reproach us, to mock us, to make us a laughing stock. God is alive. God is glorious. He is the one in ultimate control. Let God lead us. And let God do His work upon us. Then look at the response. Then I told them of the hand of my God. So He told them, It's God. It's not me. I am simply a cup bearer. I cannot do these things without God leading me. He's the one who spoke to the king. He's the one who spoke to the governors. He's the one who spoke to Asa. He's the one who spoke to the military people. He's the one who orchestrated all these things. And God was so good upon me. Look at verse 18. Also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And then he even shared not only what God is doing, even what the king had said, and even the authority passed to him, given to him. Glory to God! And what was the response of the nobles, the Levites, the priests, and the people, the leaders, the elders of Judah? They have one voice. Let us rise up and build. Let us rise up and build. And then so they strengthened their hands for this good work. Again, be reminded that as we are progressing, as we are doing something good, as we are seeing that there is a better man of the situation, there is productivity, there are those who will try to pull us down. There are those who will try to stop. Remember during the time of Ezra, if you have read the book of Ezra, during the time of Zerubbabel and Josiah, they were stopped by opposition. And the work stopped for 20 years. And then Ezra came <clears throat> in Ezra chapter 7, all the way to chapter 10. They were able to finish the temple. And yet, Towards the end of that book, the opposition was intensifying. So there is always opposition. There are people who don't like you to be blessed. There are those who don't like you to see progressing. But thanks be to God, because that's not God's plan for us. <clears throat> and look what they have said to Nehemiah. Then yeah, this is the third thing, okay? Uh, from chapter uh, 2, 11 to 20, building the envisioned wall. Building the envisioned wall. So he talked to the nobles, to the Levites, to the priests, and to the elders, and he talked to the leaders, and they were motivated, encouraged, and they said, let us build up the wall. But there was an opposition. And look what, what, what uh, they have were accused of him. Why are you here? Sanballat is leading the opposition. Why are you here? And this is the question that they throw against Nehemiah. What is this thing that you are doing? Are you going to rebel against the king? They are throwing stones of accusation without knowing that Nehemiah have all the needed resources to rebuild the wall. He has... He has the authority of the king. He has the blessing of the king. He has the permit of the king. But you know, oppositions will always tell a lie. Those who don't like you to progress will always mock you, ridicule you, put you down. But thanks be to God, when God has His hands on you, you will always see blessings and guidance and protection so they asked him why are you here and this is the response of Nehemiah the God of heaven he will prosper us therefore we we his servants will arise and build but you have no portion no right nor memorial in Jerusalem 
you will see that it will be accomplished. You will see that it will be rebuilt. You will see that it will be fulfilled. Everything will be completed, but you don't have the right. You don't have the portion. You don't even have the memorial in Jerusalem. Oh, glory. Glory to God. Now, quickly, what are the applications that we can see here? Number one, Nehemiah demonstrates prayerfulness. In this time that we are in, we are to be prayerful. Because prayer is communing with God. Prayer is an author declaration that, Lord, I cannot do. I cannot accomplish anything without you. I am declaring my dependence upon you. That is prayer. And prayer is an antidote to human pride. Prayer is humility before God. Prayer is an acknowledgement that God is the one who will make a difference in our lives. So, Nehemiah demonstrates prayerfulness. Secondly, Nehemiah demonstrates patience. Could you imagine who waited for a long period of time? And when he was given the opportunity, when the king asked him, what is your request? Instead of answering outrightly, he prayed before God. Amen. Amen. So Nehemiah demonstrates patience. Thirdly, Nehemiah demonstrates dependence upon God. He let God do the leading, do the guidance, do the working. He's just following the lead of God. He's not before God, but God is before him. He is not making suggestions before God, but he is simply listening to God. Nehemiah demonstrates dependence upon God. And then fourthly, Nehemiah demonstrates the divine heart of God. What do you mean divine heart of God? He has the heart of God. What, what can we see in the heart of God? A missionary heart. Could you imagine he, 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 he was a cupbearer? He has no knowledge about engineering jobs. He has no knowledge about architectural jobs. He has, no, he has no knowledge about administration. He has no knowledge about leadership. He has no knowledge about uh, gathering the people, mobilizing the people. He has no knowledge about all these things. But when God impressed upon him the vision he responded by saying, Lord, I am here. Use me for your glory. So it is not an excuse, my friend. It is not an excuse, my beloved. Your situation in life, your position in life, God can use you if you will simply allow God to make your life be a blessing for His glory, for His praise. Maybe God wants to do something through you in you. Respond to God like Nehemiah. He responded. And you know, what I liked here is that uh, uh, he exalted the Lord. He allowed God to be uh, seen. The watching eyes, the observing eyes, every time they are looking at Nehemiah, what they are seeing is not Nehemiah, but they are seeing the presence of God upon his life. And this is a challenge. May God see in us, and may the people see in us, God. May they see in us the presence of God, the power of God, the influence of God. May they see that our God is the one providing for all of our needs. That God is the one uh, putting this peace in our hearts, in our minds, in our souls, in our spirit. Let God be seen in us. And it, can be, it will be possible, my friend, if you will start to acknowledge your sin before the Lord. Lord, I have sinned against you. I know that you have done everything for me uh, through the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, I acknowledge my sin and I acknowledge that I cannot change my life. No way I can change myself. No way I can change my mind, my heart and everything. There is no power within me that I can change the faculty of my being. Lord, only you can change me. And let your goodness, Lord, lead me to repentance. 
that I may turn from all my wicked ways and 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 in in the gift of faith that you have given me, I will place my trust in Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life that will bring me to your heaven. My friend, God demonstrated his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is the high time, this is the moment, this is the day of salvation, this is the day of redemption. Open your heart to Jesus. Receive Him right now. Accept Him as your Lord and Savior. Pray a simple prayer. Wherever you are right now, pray this prayer, Lord Jesus. I know I am a sinner. Be merciful to me. And thank you for the gift of forgiveness, peace, eternal life, and a personal relationship with you. Lord Jesus, I receive you right now. And one day bring me to your heaven. And may now... Be a day wherein I am fully secured in my relationship with you. To you, brothers and sisters who are part of this worship, I encourage you. Don't wait for the time that it will be late. Now is the time to serve the Lord. Now is the time to make our lives to shine for our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the time and this is the day wherein the watching world will see that God is making a difference in you, in me, in our lives. That we will be the salt of the earth. That we will be the instrument that God will use to bring a change. That we will be the advocate of peace. That we will be the advocate of transformation. That we will be the advocate of the power of prayer. That we will be the ones known to be the followers of Jesus Christ. And they will see that through our lives it is possible that this world will be better. As they are watching our lives, they will attest the truth. That truly God is in ultimate control. Oh Heavenly Father, help us. We don't know what to do. The enemy Lord is attacking us on all sides of our lives. Oh God, every time we are, we are tuning in the radio, in the television, in the mass media, the social media, negative news after negative news, oh Father. But Lord, thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ because you provided for us victory. Oh Lord, free us and bring us, Lord, into your life so that, Lord, you will begin to work in us and through us. I pray, Lord, for the situation that we are in right now. Deliver us, Lord, from this mess. Lord, rebuke the acts of violence, aggression, chaos, and anarchy. And we pray, O oh Father, that even though there are a lot of opposition going on, Lord, for the truth, let the truth prevail because the truth will set us free. O oh, Father, to you the glory, the praise, and the honor. I pray for those, Lord, who made a decision to accept you, to receive you as the Lord and Savior. And I pray, O oh Father, that you will, Lord, challenge your people, Lord, to commit our lives so that, Lord, more people will hear the good news that the Lord Jesus Christ is saving lives and transforming lives. To you the glory, the praise, and the honor. And, Lord, we pray that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of our Heavenly Father and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon you all right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. And I'm just like what we are always uh, declaring before our, um, our um, assembly, our gathering, that God loves you. And this is the reason why we love you. God bless you all.